is the Chris Abraham Show. Hey there, this is Chris Cast, aka The Chris Abraham Show, Season 5, Episode Lucky 13, and I am here to make an analogy and reveal a family secret. So first, the theme of today is about why we were all lied to about uh, the status of COVID-19 in the world and why we're generally lied to by the government about everything, about uh, Russiagate, about laptops, about Hunter Biden, about Trump, about Biden, about everything. And uh, it's generally done in good faith but it's still uh, lying and hiding and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of gaslighting. And that gaslighting is important too. It's important that you are eventually inculcated in the belief and the official story of the narrative. And let me explain that. So. The personal story is back in 1995, I moved back to Hawaii, where I grew up, back to Oahu, where I grew up, from Arlington, leaving my mother and my girlfriend, Stephanie, behind. And um, we left, my dad and I drove my early 1980s, I think it was a 1980 uh, Mercedes 300D called Gertrude which we called um, Gertie, drove her cross country, threw her in a shipping container, flew to Hawaii, and prepared for a very important, big $100,000, and at that point that was big, uh, gig, where we would, as um, Pacific Rim Productions, as we would, as a team, fly to Puerto Rico, stay at um, uh, El Conquistador, which is a big resort, and it might not be called that anymore, and I think Fajardo, Fajardo, and um, we would be there for four weeks, uh, or three weeks, or something, maybe four weeks, we'd be there four weeks or five weeks, we'd go there in advance, we'd get ready, um, half the team lived in the resort, the other half of the team lived in a condominium across the bay. And on the week before the final week, like over the weekend maybe, but before the final week of... Uh, so the way it worked is every week for three weeks um, or four weeks, the people all across the country who sold... Uh, GM parts, Mopar, etc. The winners of the highest sales, the highest revenue, whatever, would have an all expenses paid trip to El Conquistador, which is a five star resort. Um, they would be able to spend a week with their partner, with their spouse. And over the course of that week, my dad, um, uh, Mikey, uh, Mary and I and uh, uh, Frick, most awesome guy. Um, anyway, we would all uh, chase after these folks and take photographs of them real time. And by Friday, Saturday or Sunday or whatever night, uh, we would um, have an entire slideshow uh, for the last night's um, buffet, like final dinner, award ceremony dinner, etc. And we would um, 
produced for them a uh, slide show that had music and showed all of their faces, showed all of their experiences, and was branded for General Motors and Mopar and all that other kind of stuff. So, and uh, it was awesome. But right before the final uh, week, my dad, I was in the room, maybe hung over, and we got a call that my my dad was dead. And they pushed me off for a while, and I finally was able to get passage to the hospital. And when I got to the hospital, I had already been told that my dad had that very morning gone out and uh, was photographing a bunch of GM participants th um, while they were horse riding. And while they were horse riding, my dad started to feel ants all over his body. And uh, that turned into being a massive heart attack and he died. And he was in the freezer, in the corners, at the Fajardo um, Hospital or whatever. And that I insisted on seeing him. And that was the end of the story. Now that was 95. In 1998, I was able to convince the girl that I met while I was in Hawaii after my dad's death, after spending time with Tom Yoho, the captain of the dive boat that I would dive with, after having dived with um, Mary Vandeven, and after having spent time with Tom and Mary, and, and after having gone through a, an, uh, um, a memoriam and the uh, uh, dumping of the ashes or, or uh, into the Pacific and Tom's boats and all that other stuff. It wasn't until 1998 when I was able to convince the girl that I met on Tom's boat, who was a scuba diver, who was there with her boyfriend, find out that in fact what had happened is my dad died of a massive heart attack while having sex with Mary Vandeven. You know, Mary was still married um, they were just supposed to be colleagues, and they were having sex, and I believe uh, the story goes that they were covered in whipped cream or something, and that during coitus, my dad had a massive heart attack and died. And for the next, like, I've never had this conversation with Mary, I've never had this conversation with Tom, but it colored my relationship with them. When I found out in 98, that they had in fact covered up the true uh, story of my dad's death. Um, I never spoke to them again. And I never, one time Mary reached out to me and said she had some photographs of my dad's um, and I accepted those, but I told her I would pay her Venmo and I never did because I was pissed. And even though I love Tom, I never visited him. He moved to Annapolis. Like it totally torched my friendship and my love for my close family because they lied to me to my face and they kept it up and it wasn't until uh, what they call the coconut wireless uh, the gossip um, uh, the inevitable uh, the truth wants to come out uh, apparently while Michelle was on the boat with her boyfriend they were gossiping and the story just came out that like one of uh, his best friends and fellow divers like it's a great story like who doesn't want to be fucked to death um while covered in um uh in in whipped cream uh on a tropical island uh at the top of your game at 58 with the woman i mean bob desperately loved mary like bob loved mary more than I think anybody of his entire life. Um, his girlfriends knew that. I think my mom knew that. Like, everybody knew that, right? Um, in fact, Mary's husband committed suicide. And I don't know, like, it ha I know that he was, uh, want, he was, you know, depressed and I believe he was suicidal before, but having being in a world where the woman that you desperately love and that you're married to might or might not carry a torch for someone else 
um, is a you know is is a a downright um, cliche uh, story of regret and the kind of thing that usually results in murder suicide. But since Bob is already dead, but why do I bring this up aside from wanting to share this with the five people that listen to me? Well, I mean, it's the same thing with COVID stories, right? The reason why um, Mikey and Mary and, oh, I got to remember his name. The why every, the reason why everybody lied to me, no matter who knew, and no matter if I was the only person to be lied to, and, to, and even not even knowing if my mom knew the truth. But it was to protect us, right? It was to protect us and to protect Bob and to honor his life and to um, have a noble story for a warrior, right? That's a noble story for a former Marine, you know, basically dying in battle. Dying while in the middle of working, covered in cameras, falling down, having a heart attack, dying in a place that is terrible, um, terrible first responders and terrible hospitals that Fajardo Hospital had stray dogs like running around it. It was, it was an awful place. Um, right? But not only protecting me and my mother, right? Not only protecting me and my mother, um, they were also protecting themselves, right? It was a very selfish act as well. It was an extremely selfish act. It was a cowardly act. It was an act uh, that didn't need to happen. I mean, fuck. Even then, I would have thought that it's baller to die, you know, balls deep. Like, I have no problem with that. Like, respect to my dad. But it also, like, Mary was married. So that was um, a shame. Um, once, the, once the lie starts, you have to double and triple down. Or double and treble down. Um, the lie begets the lie, but the lie always wants to tell itself. And a good story, like, in terms of my fraternity and my uh, Masonic Lodge, and in terms of my wrestling team, and in terms of my JROTC Ranger Club, and in terms of my D&D group when I was a 13, 12, 10, 12, 13 year old, dying in the middle of coitus, at the end of your life, dying young enough to be beautiful, um, while having sex, was always in a in my beautifully toxic masculine mind uh, the epitome of the way to go, right? Like the top ten ways to go are obviously uh, dying while having sex with the woman you love. Um, uh, for me, it's to die while swimming and then being eaten by a tiger shark. Um, and the third way is uh, dying while riding a motorcycle, you know? Those are the three ways that I consider to be noble deaths. The rest are sad, right? Pathetic. Dying of old age is just, you're not trying hard enough. Anyway... That's the same analogy when it comes to COVID-19 or any other kind of lies. There's this belief that you need to be protected, but that belief that um, you won't understand or you don't have the capacity to understand or you don't have full access to the big picture or um, uh, you'll take it the wrong way or you'll have a panic or you won't believe me anyway. Like, those are all the excuses why um, the truth about how dangerous COVID was or wasn't, how threatening COVID was or wasn't, how much we did or didn't need to keep people from visiting their relatives in the hospital was and wasn't. All those things come down to nuance. And there's a strong belief that we, the normal hoi polloi, are just not capable of understanding the kind of nuanced argument. And it is better to deliver us the complexity of the entire um, uh, Talmud, the entire 
um, Old Testament, the entire New Testament, in all its complexities, it's really important when it comes to the complexities of the world and the fact that there's gray and not black and white. It's really important to reduce everything to problem, to turn a amazingly complex um, assortment of books and stories, you know, in the from the original Greek, from the original Hebrew, and then you know convey that in a in a in a in a barbarian language like uh, American English is is an atrocity, and then to further reduce it uh, through you know rectors and the kind of people who in fact are as childlike as us, which are you know, Sunday school teachers thinking that reducing the complexity of a complex issue is going to do anybody any favors is wrong. And when the truth eventually does come out, then the wrath is going to be upon those who, even though they might have done things in good faith, uh, not only were they trying to protect us, the people, from uh, from misinterpreting what we were doing, uh, perceiving things as actually, you know, monstrous, such as, you know, keeping people who are retired in their homes to die, or putting people onto resuscitators where they would never be revived again, or um, uh, not doubling down every time there was any type of uh, side effect from uh, the mRNA or J&J vaccine because um, because of a risk analysis, you know? Like, for example, when uh, we lash out at uh, auto builders because their lawyers say that there is a certain number of Camrys that can uh, explode Uh, there's a balance between the cost of a recall and the cost of of settling with um, you know with the people with the families who've died you know when the uh, whatever the Pinto exploded right like you don't all of a sudden come out and preemptively if a few Pintos explode uh, by the way Camrys are perfectly good cars cars I was using that as an example but There were problems with Audis back in the day. Audi 5000s, you know, would spontaneously, supposedly spontaneously accelerate or or Pintos would blow up when they were hit from behind, etc. And like, there was a long, there's a long time before that hits the news when the, uh, when the lawyers in Detroit or in Stuttgart, wherever Audi is from, when they um, decide that it's cheaper to settle um, civil lawsuits than it is to uh, stop production or recall cars or revoke cars or do any kind of other extremely expensive things. And in a world where the... um, in, In a modern world where we're doing things at any, you know at any cost and by any means necessary in a world of what's perceived as right-wing extremism, uh, left-wing and right-wing populism, uh, counterculture, when there's a history of anti-vaxxers, which might have been a, you know, the the issue of anti-vaxxers and turning that into a thing happened, you know, a decade before COVID happened, it feels like maybe if I were to be uh, paranoid, I would say that that was a a preface to the rest of the story. But let's just say we told the truth, which is uh, we are sacrificing uh, a thousand so that a million might live, or uh, we are uh, sacrificing the liberty of those people who are fit as a fiddle. Because there's a lot of people who have who have um, uh, polymorbidity, who have multiple morbidities, and as a result, we are sacrificing economies. We're sacrificing 
uh, access to your to your uh, dying parents. We we're, we're sacrificing access to face to face schools. We're sacrificing uh, the we're sacrificing the healthy so as to protect the infirm. But America, as I said in a previous episode, is mostly infirm. Most people only survive because of modern medicine. Most people who have, you know, diabetes, who have heart disease, who have heart failure, who have uh, cancer, who have uh, organ failure, who have type 1 and type 2 diabetes, who have... Um, issues with, uh, with any type of chronic issue, they are only alive thanks to uh, medications and protocols. And keeping people alive who are in nursing homes and so forth it was decided to be a worthy sacrifice for all the healthy people who would have been fine to uh, live their lives um, in, in a very, you know, normal way, uh, without lockdowns, maybe, you know, maybe with masks, but certainly, uh, with schools, with, 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 um, you know, depending on what families decide to do, uh, depending on what schools decide to do or whatever, but not being a, an entire giant lockdown. And, even though it needed to be reduced and it needed to be made really simple, right? You can't, the, once the complexity starts, then the mistakes are being made. Little did they know that when you crack down on an economy, it starts to develop gray markets and black markets, right? So while all those shutdowns were made, there were uh, underground churches, there were underground discos, there were underground uh, sex clubs, there were under, underground, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There were a lot of people who did not follow the rules, and there were a lot of people who committed suicide or died uh, from uh, secondary diseases and so forth because they couldn't visit the doctor in a regular way, and things were being reduced to video uh, video uh, visitations. Now, that was all the kind of, you know, with regards to telling me about my dad's death in an alternate reality timeline where he died uh, out photographing in the field. He was photographing equestrians from General Motors who were taking an equestrian tour and he was running around in his rubber slipa and his short shorts and his, and his aloha shirt and his uh, ugly, ugly old man glasses. And he was showing off his tattoos, even though he hated doing that. He was photographing them, and he got uh, riled up, and he was smoking and drinking like a chimney. So even though, and he wasn't swimming every day, and so as a result, his he was vulnerable, and he wasn't seeing the cardiologist, and so uh, covered in bags, covered in uh, you know dozens of pounds of equipment, he had a massive heart attack. Is completely plausible. There's, you know, I had no reason to believe that uh, what I thought were my friends. They were never my friends. They were always Bob's friends. And because I was an, the enemy of the state, because I was my mother's son and my mother was an enemy of them, uh, I was never trusted. I might have been loved, but I've never been trusted. So they were not my allies. And I... Uh, was lied to, right? And so, once that happens, you lose sight of the fact that they might have done this for my to to protect protect Mary's marriage, to protect Mary's husband, to protect Bob's reputation, to make everything look kosher, and also the artificial narrative was uh, the official narrative that everybody at the um, General Motors, the company that hired us, the company that, in, that we insisted we do the final week for them in spite of my dad dying, that we, that we would uh, uh, satisfy the contract, that we would soldier through. Um, that was the official narrative for everybody involved in there. 
It might have even been the PR woman who um, uh, hired Bob, um, who was fond of him and might have been having sex with him. It might have been that he was sleeping with her and that's who uh, the sex was being had with. But she might have, as a PR professional, might have come up with that official, um, that official uh, line. But that said, my point and my analogy is that once, once you know, Michelle, uh, five, six, seven, eight, three years later, tells you the truth, and once you dig through all the lies, you don't long, you no longer believe that your government is there to protect you. You believe that the government is there to protect themselves, to protect uh, Pfizer, to protect J and J, to protect their mistakes, and to cover their asses. You don't see that they sacrifice themselves on uh, the uh, IED of the integrity of the American psyche and that they were sacrificing the few for the many. All we see is that um, we could have been out doing stuff, that our kids could have been out doing stuff, and that um, it was our responsibility to protect our elders and our infirm it wasn't the government's responsibility to do that. And that as a free nation, it was our responsibility to take care of ourselves and not the responsibility of a non-tyrannical, non-authoritarian government to not pull a non-martial law shutdown on us against our will and our desire. And so, like the resentment that I feel, it blew up in Mary's face, it blew up in Tom's face. I don't know if they ever cared. It doesn't really matter. It had no ultimate effect. That's the uh, diesel truck, the diesel uh, dumpster trucks that always go by. Sorry if you can hear that. So, I mean, it's a, it's a simple mistake, right? It's a lot of covering their own asses. It's a lot of uh, the started with good intentions, got out of control, needed a solution, pulled uh, an mRNA... Um, um, you know, in the beginning, when, when Donald, President at the time, Donald Trump, offered the mRNA and J&J &J vaccines, the left absolutely said that they would reject it. And the entire time, like I've said before, the extremist populist left and the extremist populist right have a strange level of an agreement, which is anti-medicine, anti-science, uh, very much... Um, pro-spirit, pro-food uh, as medicine, and pro-plant uh, medicine, and very anti-science, uh, anti-mainstream, uh, uh, um, and this populism is what has gone and become uncontrollable, and the hearts and minds war has become extremely difficult to control. Uh, the bull has, uh, has started bucking and uh, the establishment really doesn't know how to deal with this. The establishment only knows that they need to call everybody white supremacists, they need to call everybody terrorists, they need to call everybody, um, if you're brown and believe in this conspiracy, you're uh, uh, the brown faced of white supremacy. If you are back and believe this, then you're the black face of white supremacy. And if you're a white face and believe this, then you're a white supremacist. You're a racist, you're an anti-Semitic, you're anti-science, uh, you're a uh, transphobe and all these other things. And, and these tools are not working anymore because it's a moral majority. Uh, which the left now considers immoral, but they consider themselves a morality play. They're very Christian, they're very traditional, they're very binary, they're very cisgender. Um, and as a result, um, if, if none of these kryptonites work with them anymore, then what is the next step? Uh, in many cases, Mary or the woman who from, from General Motors or um, Mikey or whomever, like whoever started this idea of this official narrative, even though it did, um, it did surely 
uh, what is the term? It did soothe me. It did. Uh, it did answer my questions. It did come through. It did make sense to me. When I found out the truth, it drove me crazy. And the truth didn't set me free. The truth uh, almost broke me up with Michelle. Uh, the truth drove me crazy. The truth made me angry at Tom Yoho. The truth made me uh, never want to see him again. Uh, it blew everything up. And uh, I don't know how it's going to result in America. I do know that um, uh, Robert uh, Kennedy Jr., who's now a populist Democrat uh, trying to compete with Biden for the nomination as uh, for president on the Democratic side. I know that he's got teeth. I know that he is um, uh, anti-vax. I know that he is revealing truths about the, uh, the COVID lockdown, about um, uh, how his JFK um, liberalism is so different from modern liberalism. I'm reading a book right now, and I'm going to do a book report when I finish it, but it's going to be really interesting to see how things shake out, and I look forward to sharing it with you. What do you think? What do you think uh, is going to happen? What do you think the future holds? Do you think that this will, at the end of the day, explode in America's face? Uh, do you think that there come some more trucks? Do you think that the trust is broken? Do you think that this is... Uh, um, uh, do you think it's time for divorce? Do you think it's... Um, or do you think that the marriage will uh, be salvageable? Is this beyond uh, marriage uh, therapy? I don't know. Is this irreconcilable differences? And does that just mean that there needs to be a Republican uh, voted in again? Or does that mean that there needs to be a true populist like Kennedy voted in? Um, do you think the establishment would be okay with that? Do you think that um, America will ever be able to get neo-libs and neo-cons out of their hair? Do you think that um, mainstream media will ever not be in bed with uh, neo-libs? Do you ever think that um, there will ever be a, we will ever be unstuck from the Fed? Do you think we'll ever be unstuck from um, the military-industrial complex? Do you think we'll ever be unstuck from the uh, medical and medicine uh, complex? Do you ever think we'll be disconnected from Big Pharma? I mean, Big Pharma's done nothing but keep me alive. I mean, every single medicine, every single doctor, I am the benefit of innovation. I am the benefit of cardioversion. I am the beneficiary of tychosin, um, di di diflores, whatever. I'm the benefit of resuscitation. I am the benefit of, of amazing cardiologists and electrocardiologists. I'm at the benefit. I've benefited from the amazing hospitals in Northern Virginia and Arlington and Alexandria. I've benefited from amazing cardiologists like Dr. Lux. And um, I have nothing bad to say. I live because of uh, modern uh, blood thinners. I took the J&J &J because I felt confident that even if there was a risk of blood clots, that every day I take uh, a blood thinner. So I just assumed it would be moot. One would take out the other. So I personally was unaffected by the lockdowns. I work online. I don't have kids. I don't have a wife. I am a homebody. I love the internet. I love message boards, forums, social media, Macedon, Twitter. I love Netflix and Amazon. I love Hulu Live and Hulu Plus. I love YouTube. And I love wandering around like I am now in the Penrose Square Park. Sitting here with my headset and my Ethos water and my quad espresso from Starbucks. And 
The only difference between now and total lockdown is that uh, I could not, I had to stay out here. I had to be outside, which I'm perfectly happy with. And uh, I had to keep a, um, uh, a buff around my neck so that people would see that whenever I was around anybody who had a mask or I needed to go into Giant or any place, I would pull the buff up around my face and it would be close enough to masking that people would care. So I'm not coming from a place of resentment. I resented not knowing the truth about my dad, not even a side conversation. I had to find out from my girlfriend through rumors that happened on a dive boat. Uh, a, a funny story that probably thousands of uh, newly minted open water introductory divers, open water divers, paddy divers, uh, dive instructors and dive masters knew. I was uh, amongst the last people to know. And that, I resented that. And maybe that was when I started to second guess, trust but verify. Uh, that might have been the reason. That might have been the lie. 1988 even predates 9-11. And all y'all who know me know that 9-11 uh, has never gone down right my, uh, down, uh, you know, my, my esophagus or my, or my, um, you know, my gullet. I still have uh, acid reflux from that. I still vomit up bile from 9-11. So want to have that conversation with me tap me and uh, over a coffee we'll talk about it so what do you think what do you think is this something that we'll back off from is there going to be a big caterwaul or you know like everybody says like if we uh are visited by conveniently visited by a giant race of invading space aliens will we all decide to put down our swords and put down our boogaloo guns that it pointed at each other and decide instead to, you know, fight vis-a-vis -vis Independence Day. Anyway, love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. This is um, Season 5, Episode Lucky 13 of The Chris Abraham Show. My name is Chris Abraham. I'm at chrisabraham.com. And I love you long time, and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The Chris Abraham Show. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until next time.